Good morning, um, my name is Anne McCusker and you're very welcome to our webinar this morning on Introduction to Health Literacy. Um, so what I will do is go through a number of definitions of health literacy, explore the impact on inequalities, and then look at a number of evidence-based tools and techniques that have been developed that will support you to practically implement health literacy into your work and your planning and your policies. Um, and then look at further training and information and support that is available. This is Health Literacy Month during October. So there are a number of um, seminars and training events happening, um, mostly online. Um, so I'll share information on those with you um, later in the webinar. Um, the UK Health Literacy Group are holding a number of lunchtime seminars every Thursday in October and recordings of those are available or you can join live um, tomorrow or any Thursday on a variety of topics. So um, Belfast Healthy Cities is a member of the WHO European Healthy Cities Network and during phase six health literacy was um, one of the core themes within the goals and requirements for the phase. It was during our phase six workshop where a number of partners um, who were non-health identified health literacy as an interesting topic to explore. And we started off with really um, identifying what the term meant. Um, and through a working group who include um, Queen's University, Ulster University, the Department of Health, um, Belfast Health and Social Care Trust, Community Development Health Network, a number of partners, we uh, set about over the last seven years looking at uh, raising awareness and building capacity on health literacy. And I suppose the internet, the, the network there is really interesting in that um, each city that works on health literacy takes a different approach according to the needs of the city. And it's a really good network for sharing information um, and best practice. So what is health literacy? It may be a term that you're familiar with or not. Um, but I suppose you can hazard a guess from the term that it, it's linked to literacy and it's about um, a person's knowledge, motivation and their competencies to access, understand, appraise and apply health information. So essentially it's about health information being available at a time when people need it in a way that they can understand it and they can apply it to their lives, make a good judgment, make a good decision. Um, we use this definition, which is from um, the WHO Solid Facts series, um, the publication on health literacy, but there are a number, and um, they're essentially the same. And it's about everyday health decisions, um, it's about disease prevention, and it's about managing any condition that you may have. Um, and it's also uh, about, um, I suppose it changes right across your life. So um, whether it's for yourself or whether you become a parent or whether you're looking after someone um, in a current role and there's different types of information that you need to know at different points of your life. So it's about having that information readily available from trusted sources that you can make a good decision and apply it. Um, a definition um, from Alona Kickbush. Um, identified health literacy as the capacity to make sound health decisions in the context of everyday life. So it's in the home, in the community, at work, in the healthcare system, being able to identify the right services at the right time um, within the marketplace and in the political arena. And it is very much um, a, a policy area of focus, um, certainly for WHO Europe and all 53 states. Um, that are involved in um, WHO Europe, but also um, at different, in different countries across Europe. Um, some have taken a standalone health literacy policy focus, or it's embedded within um, public health frameworks like within Making Life Better here in Northern Ireland. And this is a really fantastic project that was developed by the Northern Health and Social Care Trust. Um, part of community planning and alongside the Western Health and Social Care Trust as well um, and the Northern Healthy Lifestyles Partnership 
And it was really to um, work with people in communities to identify what is health literacy if we're raising awareness of this term, what is the understanding of the term. And um, so they came up with a, a logo um, and their own definition and a strap line. So it's essentially um, about taking the time to ask and making the time to listen. So it is definitely that balance between um, the, the skills and abilities that people have and uh, the complexity and the services within the health system and trying to um, be that balance and, and health professionals are the critical enabler um, within this. So the definition um, that the group came up with is health literacy is about our knowledge, skills, understanding and confidence to be able to use health and care information and services to make good health decisions. So the Chief Medical Officer, um, Dr. Michael McBride, at a seminar of ours a number of years ago, um, had a few points to make around health literacy and its importance um, and uh, within making life better framework and generally within um, the health system. So I'll show that video now. Firstly, we know that health literacy is one of the major determinants uh, address that will help us address health inequalities, along with age, along with income, educational status. Health literacy makes a significant difference in individuals' ability to navigate their way through uh, a complex healthcare system, to understand the information that we in health provide in terms of health seeking behaviour, in terms of health improving behaviour, in terms of informing the choices. Uh, that people make. Now, if we're fundamentally serious about addressing health inequalities, improving health and well-being, then we need to be serious about improving uh, people's health literacy to enable them to make the sorts of choices uh, that we're all confronted with on a day and daily basis. Healthcare can do amazing things. It's extremely complex, complicated, and it's particularly complex and complicated uh, for those who are most vulnerable in, in society. Well, there are a number of priority areas. I think first and foremost, it's for us working in health to ensure that we're providing information to allow people to make informed decisions. That means looking at everything in terms of how we present leaflets about our screening programs, uh, how we uh, provide information about accessing services, how we provide information in an easy to understand way. I mean, one good example, I think, is the infogram that the four uh, UK chief medical officers have recently produced around uh, exercise. So it's about looking at how we translate messages in a way that people can understand, that they can internalize, and then they can make uh, decisions on. But it's also uh, for us as health professionals, how we interact with people who use services, uh, how we use a language that people can, can understand, how we can appreciate what it's like to be on the receiving uh, side of, of health service, and tailor our language, and tailor what we do, and how we interact uh, appropriately. Well, I, I think actions such as the event that we're at today, you know, the local and international research that's going on, uh, the fact that we have now have a resource, an online resource, uh, where we can all access that information, give thought to how we uh, plan services, how we commission services, how we uh, deliver services. Health literacy needs to be embedded as a strategic approach right across the health service. It's so only by ensuring that we improve health literacy, that we will address some of the issues that we see in terms of people presenting too late uh, with complications of disease. It's only by improving health literacy that we will reduce some of the demands on our healthcare service. Okay, so from the video, I, I mean, there are there's some very key points that he made, but the one that always stands out for me when I see the video is, what is it like to be on the receiving end of services? And sometimes we forget when we are delivering a message or developing materials um, or pointing people in the direction of where they can get help, when we're so familiar with the message and how the service works, it can be 
um, easy to forget what it was once like when you were new to the whole system and the whole information. So it, it is very important to provide information in a very understandable way that can support people to access it. I mean, I think currently we're in a very good example of information um, not always being clear and not always being accessible. And we will look at the development of messages through COVID-19 that we can remember how we all felt receiving them and how things are currently changing um, and how it is so important to know where the up-to-date and trusted sources of information are and when we access them, are they easy to understand? So uh, in terms of health literacy or how it shows up in people's lives, um, it is a, a critical determinant of health. It, it's something that should be included in all health promotion, health education information. Um, and it's important, I suppose, health literacy is the balance between um, the services and the demands of the healthcare service and also the skills of people engaging with them. Um, and it's that balance in between that um, allows people to engage appropriately, to find information um, when they need it in the form that is usable in a way that they can understand. And health professionals are a, a critical enabler of this to happen. Um, you may think, well, this is like health education, it's like health promotion, but it's the role of both sides ensuring that um, the information provided is understood and then the person um, being able to understand it and being able to apply it to their lives. Um, it's a public health goal and it in, improves health outcomes and it's a foundation for building individual and collective capacity um, for people to act. It, it certainly um, includes shared decision making, but it's also um, a real valuable tool for enabling people to make good decisions. So who is affected? At the minute, we don't have a baseline for Northern Ireland, but if we look at um, research that has been done and studies that have been done um, by our near neighbours, we can... Um, assume that the level of need in Northern Ireland is similar. So Ireland took part in the uh, European Health Literacy Survey in 2012. They were one of eight countries that took part and they identified from the survey that 40% of Irish people had limited health literacy. Um, and this is just in general terms of understanding health information at the time that they needed it. And um, when we look at research done in England, um, it found that the percentage of adults aged 16 to 65 for whom health information was too complex, that was 61% of people that was involved in the study. So when you think of the amount of information that's produced and the effort that goes into that and the screening that happens, even with all things considered, um, between 40 and 60% of people that are receiving the information didn't understand it, if you look between Ireland and England. And then when we apply that to long-term conditions, you see if that slide is just covered, um, for um, people with long-term conditions, the need for health literacy is even higher. So you need to understand how to manage your condition um, what makes it easier, what affects it. But when we looked, a study that was done in England um, related to people with long-term conditions found that um, where people had more than one long-term condition that they were managing, um, their level of health literacy was lower. So in terms of being able to adhere to guidance and medicines management, um, or even following instructions, it, it may be more complex and the more information you have to take on board. So it's about making it as easy as possible. I suppose health literacy is very important during the, the current transformation agenda of services and also how things are, how health services are being delivered currently and how you engage. And I suppose now more than ever, it's a really important issue. 
when we look at the profile um, of Northern Ireland from the 2011 census that was developed by NISRA, um, we can see that for the population aged um, 65 plus, for long-term conditions, there are 102,000 people with long-term conditions, 73,000 that are managing long-term pain and discomfort, and 57,000 with chronic illnesses. Um, so that was based on the census of 2011, um, and I suppose we'll have more up-to-date information after the census of um, 2021. But it does highlight how prevalent the issue is and how important it is for people to have um, information that they can use in a way that will inform them to make the best decision for them. So in terms of um, how it shows up in people, um, people with low health literacy um, are likely to have higher levels of unemployment from the studies that were done. And it is, while it affects all people, um, those living in areas of deprivation are most adversely affected. Um, it can increase health problems and um, disabilities in terms of managing information and managing conditions. Um, there are higher rates, higher proportions of self-reporting poor health. So people with lower levels of health literacy perceive their health and their, their quality of health to be lower. Um, may engage in less um, physical activity and higher rates of smoking. When we look at um, the Scottish Health Literacy Plan and um, making it easy, we find um, facts and figures in their studies that have been done in the United States of America identified that the impact of inadequate health literacy um, was an estimated cost in the region of 106 to 236 billion per year. And within that could be included um, uh, missed appointments, where uh, studies have been done um, through NUIG in Galway, the university, uh, an audit of um, the local hospital and people attending appointments. And they find that people did show up in the building um, for their appointment, but when they got to the door, signage didn't relate to the information in the appointment letter. They couldn't find their way around the building and they missed an appointment through, to, through lack of being able to navigate the building rather than not wanting to attend. So there are many reasons um, for people not being able to engage in health services. Um, along with that, you know, signage and the functional elements are, are important and um, the written information that we provide, but also the, the understanding and being able to apply it um, to your lives. Um, the Scottish Health Literacy Plan also identified that those with lower levels of health literacy have higher rates of emergency admission, could be um, linked to not being able to access um, services at the time that they need to or leaving it until a time when it was an emergency and they had to um, engage in, with the emergency department instead. And I suppose it is important for, for people um, but when you are, um, when you have the role of a carer or you're looking after children and you're making decisions for them and their health, it's really important to have a good understanding or a good level of um, functional health literacy as well. Um, and a study in England found that 43% um, of working age adults had difficulty trying to calculate a childhood dose of paracetamol. So it is really important for anyone that would be um, looking after children and managing their own long-term condition or um, have the role of a carer as well. So the World Health Organization um, really have health literacy as a priority for all countries um, within WHO Europe. And they um, developed a roadmap for health literacy for all nations, and um, so all 53 states have signed up to this. It was ratified last year in 2019 at the regional committee. And the approach that they have suggested is a, a four level approach. So it's for governments to develop health literacy policies and have data informed policy um, around health literacy and where it fits into their, their public health messages, into their health service. And very important for us at the minute, as we are looking at the transformation of services, 
Within communities, um, it's about enhancing um, cross-sectoral partnership on health, um, looking at the life course approach. So across your life, your need for health information will change, but at any point, you should have information that is easy to access um, in a way that you can understand it and, and apply it to your life and you're motivated to, um, to put it into place. Um, there are really good initiatives that are happening already. When we started our work on health literacy, we identified that a lot of people are um, working in this way, but maybe haven't explicitly mentioned health literacy within their community health programs. Um, but it is important to consider it in an, its most explicit way and ensure that it is being um, taken on board. Um, the Community Development Health Network have a really good project around self-care and health literacy training and health inequalities. And also the community health um, project in the northern area that I mentioned earlier. And there are other ones um, on our website. There are presentations from previous seminars that we have had that have included um, Ballybean Women's Centre. So it is being considered, but it, it, it should be embedded right across for organizations um, where there is an interest and where there is the opportunity to include health literacy, it's important that it's right across all parts of the organization. So we are currently developing an organizational audit that will um, support organizations or departments to look at the information that they're providing and the staff training that's available and even the physical layout of their building if it supports people to engage effectively. Um, and if you want more information on that, you can contact me. Um, and then for people, it, it, so health literacy is definitely a, a partnership between um, people, individuals, communities, and um, health services. And it's about finding that balance. Um, and it's about um, developing, promoting um, the concept of health literacy to understand what it is and why it's important. Um, and then ensure that there's um, the element of co-production and information that's being provided and feedback from people that are um, engaging in services and those that wish to but aren't able to. So it, it uh, definitely on the policy agenda locally um, and uh, with um, WHO Europe as well. Um, I suppose uh, with WHO Europe, uh, they have um, aligned it very much to their NCD agenda, so non-communicable diseases. So um, in terms of cardiovascular cancers, um, chronic respiratory and diabetes, they see health literacy as a key element of um, promotion and um, prevention and in, in supporting people with um, conditions. I think um, across Europe, there are 36 million people that die from these and conditions. So it's, it's very important to raise awareness. Um, and it, it is very complex, but in terms of um, having information available, um, health literacy is key within that. It's within our own public health framework, making life better and will be enhanced within the review. Um, the circle in the center um, is the Healthy Cities Network framework for phase seven, which um, we're currently in. So the six P's are people, place, planet, peace, prosperity, and participation. And health literacy features within the participation element, but they're, they're all quite, um, there's crossover between them all. So it is something that we'll be continuing to look at. Um, a piece of work that we are doing linked to the Northern Ireland Medicines Optimization Quality Framework is, and the development of a schools resource to increase understanding of community pharmacy services. Um, and another project linked to that work is through CDHA and their self-care pharmacy work. So it is about trying to raise awareness um, with children and through the, the curriculum, um, it, it fits into um, what is already being delivered in schools and then um, taking the messages home to parents and carers to ensure that there is a better understanding of services that are available and support people to make um, the best and most convenient choices. 
and then also within community planning at a local government level it has been identified explicitly in, in three of the um, plans for Causeway Coast and Glen, Mid Ulster and um, Darien Strabane and then um, right across the other area, the other council areas, it'll be included in their action plans in, in some format. So it's a very important issue. So it includes all written information, all spoken information, um, and understanding um, what information is available to um, inform the decisions that we make. Um, again, just in the context of COVID-19, you can see how services have dramatically changed um, and at times the skills, the communication skills that we would have depended on, um, body language and being able to um, identify from the person in front of you uh, that you may have been um, speaking with, um, those aren't there if the uh, consultations are over the phone. So it's important then to ensure that information is being understood and I'll go through um, tools and techniques and ways that we can just check um, that the messages that are being put across are being um, and ensuring then that um, the written information that's being provided, um, including um, any instructions that are being given, um, infographs, information through social media, that it is accurate and that it is easy to understand and follow. So some um, tools and techniques that have been developed um, to support health literacy. Um, one of them is Ask Me Three, and it was um, developed by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement in the United States. Um, and I think going back to the video where um, Dr. McBride encouraged people to you know, remember or understand what it's like to be on the receiving end of services. Um, it's about um, ensuring that people are well equipped to take away information um, from appointments or consultations or um, times when they need to receive information. So these three questions are a really good start um, if you're having a conversation so that the people can um, identify what is the main problem, um, understand what they need to do and why it's important to do that. If you have those three key points, um, it, that will cover um, a, a lot of questions that you might have after uh, the appointment or after the conversation that you might forget. And if they're written down, it's a really good way of referencing back. Um, I think a fourth one that would be really useful to include is how long for because sometimes you know what to do, but you're not always um, clear, is it for a week or two weeks? On, you know, or is it indefinite that this is something that'll be part of your life now? Um, if you're delivering care, um, it's really important. Um, I suppose when you're, you're having those conversations, it, it is about setting the scene and ensuring that the person is, is comfortable and able to receive information and two ways that you can ensure that happens is by using plain English and um, sometimes we we think that the way in which we are um, delivering our messages is clear but there is a lot of jargon within organizations within sectors there is within every sector but it's um, important to ensure that everyone can understand the information that's been given um, so to consider um, the words that are being used, um, examples at the bottom of the slide in, include um, administer, administer medication. Sometimes it's easier for people to understand to give or to take. Um, that benign means harmless and the dosage is how to take the medication or what amount you need to take or when. Um, but other, other words that have being identified in feedback was um, positive. Sometimes when people were told that their results were positive, they felt that was a good thing and it was nothing to worry about. Um, I suppose a lot of the feedback is from people that have been engaged um, around issues of health literacy or services. Um, but the 
previous chair of the Health Literacy Working Group in the UK. Um, he's a GP and she teaches the um, medicines um, course at Keele University in uh, Manchester. And she said that she studied for seven years um, to be a GP and she was so enthusiastic about her role and what she could do and how she could help people. Um, and she said the amount of terms and the, the amount of information that she learnt and the amount of terms was like to a, a new language. There were so many words that she had to learn and understand. And it was really important to know those and um, to be able to communicate with your peers. But she said she quickly um, found out that if she was using those words and terms to speak to people that hadn't studied for seven years, the information, the messages that she was trying to provide were completely lost and people just switched off because they couldn't understand the words and they thought the message wasn't for them. So, I mean, it's really important to review this and, and to ensure um, that the words and the language that we're using are easy to understand. And Teach Back is a really good way of using this. There are videos on our website and online that can show you how to use Teach Back. But it's just, it, it's just ensuring that that conversation that you're having, um, that it, it, it's easy to understand. So you provide the information, you um, assess the, the person's understanding by just asking them to clarify and you're putting the onus on yourself. You're not um, simply asking that uh, they repeat or put them under pressure to repeat what you've told them, but you just wanna check that you have given them all the, the right information um, and that you can confirm that you, you have done your job to the best of your ability by giving them what they need to know. Um, I mean, we would uh, go through this in role play scenarios and the, the training that we provide. Um, and I suppose once you get over the uncomfortable um, feeling of being in a role play, it is a really beneficial tool to use. And the feedback that we have had from people that are using it, whether it's pharmacists, nurses, GPs, um, health promotion roles is that um, there was an assumption that people did understand and that um, you know you maybe felt quite awkward using this technique at the start but the more familiar and comfortable you were with using it it's just second nature and a way of ensuring that people did understand um, and they don't always so it's really good to check um, and it can be aided with the ask me three where people write down and what they, they need to know and remember. So we've seen through um, you know, the last six months, the information that has been given around um, the, the pandemic around COVID-19. And at the, you know, at the start, the messages were very clear. Um, we all must do it. Um, it was stay at home, keep your distance and wash your hands. Um, and as the, there was greater understanding um, of the symptoms and um, what we needed to identify ourselves or around a temperature, a cough, and your loss of taste and smell, we were able to um, understand that if we had those symptoms, we could go for a test. But as, um, now these are from probably May where restrictions were being relaxed um, the guidance wasn't always clear and I, I think um, it can be difficult to develop guidance but it needs to be crystal clear in order for people to clearly understand and to be able to act on it. So some of the guidance um, issued, I think this is maybe Public Health England, but it was around staying at home where possible or work from home if you can. So who does that apply to? It's really up to interpretation. Um, and where the information is not direct and in the act of voice and clear, um, people may then um, not be as engaged or not be as sure where and how um, they're supposed to engage or act. Um, and then it developed to stay at home, no unnecessary journeys or social contact, um, only leave home for essential items. So while this is clearer, it's still not always, um, I think when, when we compare it to the previous, 
where it was very clear there was there were no um confusion around the messages the more information we give it's just ensuring that the words are very um, precise and active and clear for people to be able to act on. So we have seen that um, during the pandemic, you know, there has been so much information it has almost been referred to as an infodemic as well. Um, physical distance and um, what is the guidance? I suppose for us it was given in meters and we don't always think in meters. Um, and it's about being aware um, and being aware of the need to adhere to the guidance for yourself, but also for society as well, and why it's important to, um, to, to be involved and to do your bit, and where to get your sources of information. This, um, there has been very good information given out through the Public Health Agency, and um, through the Department of Health as well, and through a, a variety of mediums. So, I mean, where do people normally get their information? Is it social media? And there are um, lots of information through social media that is, is trusted sources through your, um, your statutory agencies, your, your health and social care trusts. Um, and it's about ensuring that people can easily access the information that they need. Um, this um, is some of the information that was developed through the Northern Health and Social Care Trust um, and tips um, for individuals um, when you are uh, receiving health information and um, things to think about. And it was really, I suppose, the main crux of it was about asking um, questions um, and ensuring that you have the space and the time to ask questions. And time is precious in um, all appointments, in all, all instances. Um, and it's really important to use that time well. And I suppose the, the tools and techniques that are available, um, they will support people to ensure that the information um, that they are being given, they can ensure that they understand it at the time and their time is used well. I suppose the main um, point here from uh, the point of view that uh, from individuals that were engaged, people in the community said it's really important for people to ask questions if they don't understand and be more informed um, to try to build on what you've been told. For health professionals then, um, for staff, they said it was really important that the messages are simple and that there's time to explain them. And, and as I said, time is so limited. So in that time that you do have, um, how do you make the best use of the, of the time and everything that you have to cover in that time? And um, Ask Me Three or Teach Back are really good ways of making best use of that time. Um, and where possible, take more time to explain and, and explain it simply um, in a way that people can understand and, and take home the messages. So um, that's just really a very brief introduction to health literacy, what it is, how it shows up for people and where it sits in the policy agenda. But if you are interested um, in further information or looking at um, very specific areas, um, there are a number of uh, lunchtime seminars that are being delivered throughout October um, and they are being hosted um, through our sales, but um, presenters are from the UK Health Literacy Group. So the first one was last Thursday and it is recorded on YouTube and I'll send you the link in the email that you'll receive tomorrow after, the, uh, after this webinar. Um, and um, the recording was by a pharmacist, Tanya Cork, and it was really just um, understanding um, health literacy in the setting of pharmacy and medicines adherence. Um, they're very short seminars, they're half an hour and there'll be time for questions after them. The one um, tomorrow on Thursday is around digital health literacy and barriers to access and we have Blythe Robinson, Robertson from um, NHS Scotland, the digital services team. Um, Blythe was formerly the government representative for health literacy leading the um, health literacy policy in Scotland. Then on the 22nd of October, we have um, value of preparation of people 
prior to long-term condition reviews with remote consultations. So looking at both um, remote consultations and then long-term conditions. Um, and we have uh, Dr. Graham Kramer and Professor Jill Rowlands um, presenting um, that discussion. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Graham Kramer is the former government representative for health literacy in Scotland and now a GP in Scotland. And um, Professor Jill Rowlands is the UK expert lead um, for um, health literacy and also teaches um, the medicines and program as well and then on the 29th of October and um, the session is focused on children's understanding of COVID-19 and health literacy in schools um, and that will feature um, Professor Jo Prothero who I mentioned earlier and she has recently done research around children and COVID-19 um, in a health literacy context and then I'll, I'll be going through very briefly the um, schools resource that has been developed and is being piloted in schools um, and then how it will be available and embedded in the curriculum. So I'll send a link to these seminars and they'll be, um, you can register um, via Zoom and the recordings will be available from them as well. So thank you. Um,